Psalm 103. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not his benefits, who forgives all our iniquity, who heals all our diseases, who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with steadfast love and mercy, who satisfies you with good so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord works righteousness and justice for all who are oppressed. He made known his ways to Moses, his acts to the people of Israel. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. He will not always chide nor keep his anger forever. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor does he repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. As a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to all those who fear him. For he knows our frame, he remembers that we are dust. So the greatness of God, the blessing of God, the benefits of God, he is great, he is merciful, he is faithful, and we are but dust. And so as we, as we lead our churches, as we lead our families, as we seek to draw deeper in our understanding of the word of God, number one, remember how great God is, let's bless him. And number two, uh, never forget this in your ministries, we are but dust. We are but dust. Dear Heavenly Father, as we begin tonight, Father, I pray for the internet to remain strong for all of us. I pray for that you would bind the hand of Satan and, and, and the powers that would want to, to, to end this video. May the re recording uh, go through successfully. May we also have good power. Father, I ask that your spirit will be here. And we know that even though we, we span such a great distance, your spirit is, is in each one of these rooms. And it's, we can feel your presence today, Father. May we grow deeper in our understanding of who you are. May we discover and desire to know biblical theology, uh, not for our benefit, but for your glory. It's in Jesus' name, our Lord and Savior, we pray all these things in faith. Amen. Okay, so let me try to share my PowerPoint. <laughs> okay, great. So biblical theology, this is session number two. Uh, the blossoming of God's revelation from Adam to Christ. And so we have some we have some new participants, some new both auditors and those taking for credit. We have a lot of content tonight. Ideally, we have two other sessions. I, um, I, I don't have time to go back to deal with all those the, the review. We really have to get, we have to, we're on a course. We in order to make it to the end, we have to continue on. So what what we will do is for those that are a little bit behind, it's fine. You don't, don't feel pressured to, to be involved tonight. Just listen. I think that you'll still be able to really pick up on what we're doing because this is really just the beginning of the notes. Last week was more of an introduction to the syllabus and requirements. And so we have the videos from the last two uh, meetings. We have those videos um, uh, on YouTube in the Facebook group. So Everything is being recorded. Everything is being uploaded. So if you're behind, it's no problem. We, we've left the live. So you just, 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 come, just come and join us. So uh, I'm very excited. I do want us to be thinking about this main picture here, this main picture of this flower and the seed. And we'll be discussing that tonight. And so that is a big picture of this biblical theology idea. And so we are on to session number two. So that should say session number two. I'll get this right one day. Uh, I have typos and I just, I'll apologize at the beginning, but we're, we're on to session number two, introductory issues. And just by way of very quick review of our partners. So for all of you who are joining, we are EVST, Eastern Visayas School of Theology. Uh, it's it's uh, some people, and of, of course, the original design was to, to be connected to, 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 to be a theological beacon and resource for Eastern Visayas, which would be primarily uh, Leyte Island, Island, also Samar Island and Baliran Island. But uh, historically, when you have an institution, 
it's also the origin. So it could be the range of, of where you're targeting, but it also could be the origin of the, of the institution. So for example, Oxford University, that's the origin. And of course they're worldwide. Many institutions are like that. And so, especially in the US. And so uh, we're beginning to think about, I shouldn't say we're beginning to think about, many of you are outside of Eastern Visayas. So don't think about EVST as just being focusing on region eight. This is just the point where we began, okay? So we want to change, <laughs> change that. It's the beginning point for something bigger. And so many of you are outside of, of course, I shouldn't say many, some of you are outside of uh, Eastern Visayas. So we are, we are reaching beyond, beyond borders. So uh, can everyone just check their, their mic for, uh, make sure everyone's muted. Let me just take a pause here. Check through here. Okay, just uh, always be checking your mic to make sure it's muted so it's be able to, a smooth sound. And do not hesitate to interrupt me. R really, I, you know, that, that's hard to do, but just raise your hand or just unmute and just say, I have a question and I will just immediately stop where I'm at. We, we can discuss. So that, that's really my policy. There's no such thing as interruptions here. That's just the way it's going to be. Okay, great. And then we're also, so Eastern Versailles School of Theology is really uh, the school here. But this class is a CGST class. So we're partnering together. CGST is partnering with EVST. And so um, uh, some of you are taking TH615 for credit with, CG, with Cebu Graduate School of Theology. Some of you are taking EVST, uh, the, the master's level, non accredited, and then also the certificate. So wherever you are, uh, you're welcome. And the, the level of lecture is going to be at the TH615 level because that is the primary, um, uh, that is the primary uh, level of the course. And so um, that's kind of an FYI. So if maybe sometimes it's a little bit over your head. Uh, that's because, because of the level. So don't be afraid. If that's the case, we can do a one-on-one. -on -one meeting. Uh, we, we have groups, uh, study sessions, so we'll get you caught up, okay? Um, all right, just a quick overview of tonight's session. What we're going to do is we're going to finish our discussion of reading number one and also the notes. So we'll, we'll be discussing uh, chapter number one from Voss, and so we had begun that discussion last week asking for your feedback, and so I read all those that turned in assignments. Everyone had good Everyone had good feedback. I liked everyone's feedback. I liked everyone's information. It was good. Uh, I want to hear from that a little bit. So, so for the first part of this hour, I want to just continue our discussion in uh, Boss Chapter 1. I'll probably limit it to, to 5 to 10 minutes. And then what we'll do is we'll go on to, to discuss the course notes for Chapter 1. Um, and then we'll probably have to take a break around 7 o'clock. We'll take a 10-minute break. And then we will also discuss the reading for chapter two. So I want to hear your, your feedback from chapter two, uh, things you like, things you don't like. And, um, and then we're also going to work on the, the course notes for chapter two. And then we'll have a little bit of a, if there's time, if there's time, we'll have a review. Um, because in discussing the notes, we're also going to be really focusing on your assignment, the scripture reading, assignment number one in the scripture reading okay so okay so at this time um at this time let's go ahead and i'm going to stop the share and i'm going to pull up just give me one second here i want to pull up so if you if, if you have your reading you printed it out your those who who had a uh, reading reflection report go ahead and pull out your 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 first reading reflection report as i bring up our notes on the screen and Let's discuss that. Some of you shared your, your point, uh, pro or con. Some of you did not yet. So for those who, I'm, I'm focusing more on those who did not. Um, uh, so if you, can, if you can open up your, your reading, we can discuss that. Okay, great. All right, I'm so happy. Zoom has changed things, so I'm, I'm, I'm really adjusting here. So let me just quickly review what we talked about last time, and then I want to hear your, your comments. Um, so we talked about this idea that God, um, God must be the one to reveal. So someone brought up this point last week, it, uh, and this was a point made by, by the author that, that we cannot reach out to God. 
God must first reveal and he must enable us to, to receive that revelation. And, and there is a reason for that. And Voss is going to go into details as to why it is that God must reveal and God must enable. Okay, so at this point, at this point, he's just highlighting, he's highlighting the fact in the reading that this must happen. So that was a great point. Um, someone else made the comment of uh, revelation is the interpretation of redemption. And we're going to discuss that tonight. And that is such a profound statement. And so that was an excellent uh, observation of, of, an, of agreement that revelation is interpretation of redemption. And we will see, we will discuss how this is absolutely fundamental. If you're thinking about, if you're thinking about how this is absolutely fundamental um, for redemption. We want redemption. We need redemption. Why is it that we must have revelation? Why must revelation accompany redemption? Why doesn't God just redeem us, right? So uh, we're going to be thinking about that, but that was a, a great observation made by, 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 actually many of you made that observation. So it was more than one uh, on your paper. Maybe you weren't so strong to share, but <laughs> it, reading it, multiple people made that observation. Uh, another point is the idea of, of uh, uh, the objective central acts of redemption and then subjective uh, events. And, and so we're also going to discuss why this is so, why understanding these two different, uh, different um, types of events and, and why they're so critical. And if we don't have this, this objective central acts of, a re, a re, of redemption and then these subjective uh, um, multiple occurring events that, that, that are not that are not objective, why understanding and distinguishing between these two guards and protects our theology. I, I hope and trust that you're going to see this. Um, number four, the, the, the mention of the revelation becoming incarnate. <laughs> Can you imagine? Can you imagine? The, God's revelation actually dwells among men. Many of us are in church. We have church. Many, many of us are business professionals. Can you imagine a big boss, uh, a senator, a government official, a CEO, um, not just get, revealing his will to his workers, but actually coming down to the lowliest and working alongside them? <laughs> you know, can you imagine um, Tim Cook, Apple CEO? going down to, to, to the warehouse where they and the manufacturing plant where they actually produce the iPhones and working alongside and talking alongside the workers. You couldn't imagine it. That would never happen, right? Um, but this is what has happened. This is what's so amazing about the incarnation. God's revelation becomes incarnate. It is crazy to think about. So excellent observation there. We also have this word event explanation that is connected with number two. We'll discuss that. Um, also, this concise and comprehensiveness. We discussed that as well. Uh, number seven, the idea that it's it's not only so. So some people have made this as a something they liked, and then other people wanted to do a caveat here. So I really like number seven. Uh, it's it's not just a dog. The Bible scripture revelation is not just is not a dogmatic handbook. I think Voss says it's not a dogmatic handbook, but full of dramatic interest. And so that's a, a very important to consider. Others wanted to clarify it and tweak it and say, it's not just, it's not just a dogmatic handbook, but more importantly, it's this, it's this epic story that, that's telling the story of, of a God who is saving and redeeming a lost people to himself. And so I really liked, I really liked both those that liked it and then also those that were giving the, 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 the caveat because I had the caveat. I had a little bit of the caveat in my notes. So, so you were in, you were in good company making that, 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 that uh, critique. And I was very impressed with those that made, that made that uh, critique. Um, uh, moving along here, the, the progressiveness that the event, the, the, the revelation and also uh, redemption is not a, is it, it's a, I shouldn't say redemption is a one-time event, but revelation is not a one-time. It just—it's not just here's what here's what you need to believe. 
it's, it's unfolded over progressive stages. And so that was also meant a lot to some people here. So I'm, what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna, for the next five to 10 minutes, if no one comments, we'll just move on into the notes. But what, what are some other observations that you want to include? What are some other things that, that stuck out to you? Um, let's talk about, let, let's continue this discussion. Maybe, maybe someone wants to become strong and give a critique and then maybe there'll be pushback. So, so, so Tim. Yeah, go ahead, Sonny. All right, so uh, <clears throat> I just want to know if, if uh, Vos believe in um, creation covenant or covenant of creation uh, as pertains to a progressive uh, as he as he uh, implied or I think he is saying that uh, the covenant is progressively taken or you know being done in the whole scripture so yeah. I am um, yeah I would want to know if if Vos is into that uh, kind of, of so Oh, yeah. framework like um, so, creation covenant. Yeah. Okay. So, so l let me get a clarification from you, just to be to, to be clear. When you talk about creation covenant, or or I think I think in your thing you mentioned um, progressive covenantalism. Is that what you mentioned before? Y yes. Yes. Progressive covenant from from covenant of creation to new creation. I mean, new covenant. Um, yeah. Uh, which is which is for 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 that caveat. Uh, that says that the new covenant is Christ Himself. Christ is the new Israel, the new church, or something like that. Yeah. So, 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 so just to give up, I want to just because pe the reason why I'm, I'm I'm asking a further question is because there's a lot of different people use words. So there's so so. Are you referring more towards that perspective from like a new covenant perspective? Is is is, is that kind of where you're yeah, coming yeah. from? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. No, that's very Absolutely. helpful. Okay. So so Sonny is asking a framework question for those of you who are unfamiliar. There's different views of, on on the framework of how all of this plays out. Okay, so so Voss says the covenant is central, and so a lot of people will will agree with that. And then there's different frameworks that they will they will say. And so um, Voss would not be within that progressive covenantal framework um, because in, in many ways it would be anachronistic. If if, if everyone's a, a familiar with the it's a big word anachronistic it means it means to say that that framework was post boss boss has died and that's that's a recent um clarification or framework that has come out in the past maybe 20 years um and so boss would be in his framework if you're thinking okay so what specific framework is boss coming from he would come from a covenantal uh framework so you would have a covenant of redemption that in, a, in eternity's past the, the Trinity made the decision together to, to redeem a man, man, mankind. And so when we talk about um, the, the covenant of redemption, it's nothing more than the, the agreement by the Trinity. God wills it. Christ secures it. The Spirit gives it, <laughs> right? And he actualizes it. He, he brings it into reality in our, in our, in our hearts. So that, that's, that's, that, that, that is what part of the 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 co a traditional view of the covenant um uh perspective would be and that would be what boss would hold to he'd also hold to a covenant of creation in the sense that all of creation is accountable to god through this through this um uh um a covenantal a covenantal relationship and and we'll actually look at some examples if you looked at the word searches there's some examples there of of so so, so there is this idea of covenant of creation, meaning to say that all of creation is in relationship with God in, in, in some way, okay? Um, uh, that would be the extent of his view um, of covenant of creation. Not to say that, of course, he would agree with the new creation, but the new creation would be under the, you would have the covenant of works with Adam, that also all of mankind would be under, and, and thus we are all under a curse. We all receive the curse that Adam receives, Romans chapter 5, 12, and following. And then the covenant of grace, which would be that, that, uh, um, that covenant that gives us salvation, okay? Um, and, and then we can tease out more of those details. Again, that would be probably for a different class, but what I'm trying to get at is that that would be Voss's framework 
if you were to read his systematic, uh, his, his theological questions, that would be the framework. So I, I, I kind of went, yeah, I, I'll just, I'll leave it there. We can have a discussion late, later one-on-one. -on -one. So is that helpful? Yeah, so basically, as I understood it, uh, Voss framework is like a covenant theology, something like that, yeah. like co yeah. covenant of work yeah. with Adam and then covenant of grace. Yeah, so there yeah. are two covenants. Okay, okay. Thank you. Okay, you're welcome. Um, and so I, I do want to add a caveat. If you don't hold to that, to that framework, that's completely fine. So the, the benefit of Voss is that he, he's been used, so maybe we'll discuss about this later. He's been used, to, so um, dispensationalism, uh, they, some of that, many modified to be more in agreement with, with uh, scripture. And so you had progressive dispensationalism. That's actually pulling a lot of bosses' ideas, but modifying it within their framework. There's the New Covenant, which again, New Covenant theology is also using Voss and then coming up with their own scheme. And then, of course, there's, there's traditional covenant, and they're doing the same thing. So what I'm trying to get at is that, you know, um, uh, whether or not you hold to covenant theology, that does not impact whether or not you can pull a lot of truths that Voss makes and, and add it to, to your own framework, okay? Because he is dealing with a lot of, um, he's dealing with the history of Revelation. Um, and of course, that has bearing on our framework, but it doesn't necessarily require that. So I, I hope that's making sense. So um, I don't want this to become a debate into the different frameworks because that, that just, that's like beyond this course. That's like the next level. We, we can have the class, we can have the class. But I, I do wanna, I do wanna continue to make that distinction here. Um, Great. Any other comments or questions or uh, observations? Uh, let me share, Pastor Tim. Okay. Uh, when God made revelation, it is, uh, I think, uh, for me, I observe, uh, it's always carry or accompany his primary purpose in redemption of mankind. Yeah. Yeah. So, yes. So let me just write this down here. Let me add this here. So, so you have, Revelation and you have redemption. These are, these are separate. But together. Okay, so so, so they're separate in that revelation is not redemption. You can't have redemption by revelation alone. But, this, but the same is also true. You can't have redemption without revelation. <laughs> so, 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 so excellent point. Excellent point, Henry. Excellent, excellent point. And, and again, we're going to get to an example. So you'll see this. You'll see this played out in the scripture. Um, at this point, Voss is just highlighting. Um, anyone else want to add or you want to go further? Okay, I hear Pastor that. Tim. Go ahead, go ahead. Pastor yeah. Tim. Yes. Yeah. Cyrus here. Can you hear me? Cyrus, go ahead. Yeah. I, yes, sir. So uh, this is just a quick one. So uh, actually, I don't really get the point, uh, but uh, uh, I really appreciate the uh, like the concept and everything. But I just would like to ask. So do you mean that uh, if there's no saving, there's no lear learning? Like we can't uh, know God if there's no. Uh, uh, saving, like, so, uh, like something like that. Yeah. So, I'm, I, I'm kind of gonna. I'll just give you. I'll give you. I'll give you part of the answer. If we can discuss more later, it's fine. I'll just go ahead and kind of. I'm giving you the answer right now. So, imagine, imagine. So, the, everyone agrees that our redemption is, is, is on the cross. On the cross, mm -hmm. uh, Christ took our sins. They were credited. He took our sins, so so our pun, our penalty was 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 literally credited to him, and his righteousness was credited to us. Okay, and so on the cross, our self is we're nailed to the cross with Christ. Okay, that's our redemption, and then Christ dies, and so um and then the resurrection, the resurrection is the validation, the, the, the resurrection as the new man, as the Superman, as the the God man the resurrection as the new creation that 
that was God's validation that Christ's sacrifice, the, the, the payment of the blood was sufficient. Okay, right? Everyone agrees with that, right? Um, so that's great. If we don't have the gospel, that is the actual proclaiming of what has happened, there's no application. <laughs> You see what I'm saying? If, you know, Christ could die on the cross. He could die on the cross. He could be buried. He could he could be a, he could be raised back up from the dead. We they see that happen. He could ascend up to he could ascend up into heaven, right? But if but if there's no revelation of this is what happened in Christ. This is what happened on the cross. Um, this is what you need to do. That's all. That's that's special revelation right there. If there's none of that. We could we could debate. Well, what happened? Well, he was a good man. It was it was wrong. It was terrible. But but there's no there's no explanation. There's no connecting that redemption with us. So the revelation is the gospel part. The redemption is the sacrifice part. So imagine let's 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 so let's put this out. So the revelation is the the gospel component, and the redemption is the the cross component. Uh, the act itself. This is the word. So is that, is that making a little bit of sense? Is that, is that is that is that is that kind of drawing why they're definitely two different, but they're inseparable. Add. Pastor Tim, that is why revelation is the interpretation of redemption. Yes. Because yes, because it explains yes. redemption. Yes, if you want to say explain, yes. If we want to talk about uh, explain, explain. Yes, I like that. Explain. So, so if if we can just um, let me fix this here. Let's just make. So what this is here is the relationship here is explain. So revelation explains redemption. This is a relationship here. Yes. Excellent. And that's what Voss says. And so he's going to prove it. So let me just be clear. Uh, someone had shared that there wasn't really passages of scripture. And, and I agree. You know, maybe I wish he had shared more. But in many ways, chapter one and two, it's just like, this is, these are big points. This is our, we're going to map where we're going to go. And then he gets into the, he gets into the content. Um, uh, just reading through the rest, it's like, it's just full of, of, of scriptural argumentation and, thoroughly thoroughly uh scriptural scripture based so um but but yeah i mean looking at the first chapter it's he's just giving you highlight he's it's like the opening title before he gets into the he gets into the to the movie the action the drama <laughs> if you will um let's go ahead let's go ahead and do the powerpoint um i, I hope this has wet your whistle i hope that this has piqued your interest um because I think as we work through the PowerPoint, a lot of these things will start to bring clarity. We'll also be able to um, just make a lot of sense here. So let's go ahead and let's let's begin the PowerPoint here. Let me. Uh, where is my... Okay. All right. So everyone can see the overview of session, right? Everyone can see that. So you should be looking at overview of session. Okay. Great. All right. Um, always give me the thumbs up because sometimes it will log off and I won't know and. I always have a PowerPoint or we're always working on something. So I just don't want you to see a blank screen. Okay. All right. So let's go ahead. Introductory issues. So now we're going to get into the content and feel free to stop me to ask questions because some of this is deep. This is not for the faint of heart. This is not for the basic Christian. We are going deep and, and some classes in our, in our study will be very practical. Of course, this is practical, but it's, it's also very deep. Um, okay. So, uh, First thing that we want to look at is definition of biblical theology. Definition of biblical theology, okay? So Voss's definition, um, I don't have page numbers here, and uh, the copy I have is different than your copy. So I actually, Henry, I need to, I need to get a copy of, of what everyone has because my pages are different. And so I was realizing like, I'm not matching. So I don't have page numbers tonight. I'll meet with you later this week, Henry, to, to get something like that, just so that we can have, when I give you a page number, you can go there and it's the same. Uh, my, my book is a different, it's actually a different publisher. And so that's why the page numbers don't match. Um, so Voss's definition is this. 
Biblical theology is that branch of exegetical theology which deals with the process of the self-revelation of God deposited in the Bible. So if someone were to ask you, what is biblical theology? This is what it is. Now, in fairness, there are different, slightly different definitions. You can read other biblical theologies. They will give you a slightly different uh, definition. Um, uh, and so maybe we can also have complementary. I like this definition, and I think that um, uh, what Voss offered for us was so amazing and so profound that, you know, I, I think we should go in a historical sense, we should go with his definition. We can always add tweaks, tweaks and clarifications um, later. Um, in a more general sense, it may also be defined as the history of special revelation. Now, some people might say, Tim, why is this important? Why is this necessary? Well, the reason why it's necessary is that in the history of special revelation, not everything is equal. <laughs> not all revelation is equal in the sense that earlier anticipatory revelation can be later clarified and elaborated upon. So you can never redefine this by this. You always clarify this by this. The later should clarify, elaborate, explain the earlier forms. A failure to do this will lead to heretical doctrine and in the worst case, uh, cults. Okay, so for example, um, very practical, so you can see the benefit. Uh, New Testament teaching on Trinity, later revelation, clarifies the great Shema. Hear, O Israel, there is one God, Lord, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your, with all your strength, right? The, the great Shema, right? Um, uh, a cult says, no, 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 no. Later Trinity is wrong. This is primary. The great Shema is primary. And we say, no, 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 history of Revelation, that's anticipatory. That's on the way. We, we need to clarify. So I, I hope that everyone can see now, at least uh, you can get a sense of why we're going deep. But at the same time, having this framework is foundational to guarding against false doctrine, our worship, and even our practice, okay? Um, same thing with works. <laughs> same thing with works. Same thing with works. So, oh my goodness. So I, I'm just wetting your whistle to, to, to help you to see uh, the need for biblical theology. Uh, okay, moving on. Uh, any questions or comments? Any questions or comments? Dean? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so so out, out of this definition, we, we get to understand that that the New Testament will read the Old Testament to better understand the Old Testament. Um, uh, the New Testament will be somehow our guide to a right understanding of the Old Testament. But, but here's my question. Um, uh, for, for things that are not that explicitly explained in the New Testament, but is clearly pointing to Christ. A passage just like that. Um, is it is it okay? Is it safe to look at it in a general sense? Although there is not one passage in the New Testament that speaks of that particular uh, yeah interpretation of the Old Testament. So so the answer is simply put with, with caution and carefulness. The answer is yes, Enting. Because biblical theology is dealing with not just the revelation itself, but the framework. That's why from here you get the frameworks. So like the next level is, okay, so what is the framework? Here's the, the content of the history. And then, and then the framework is a guide. You have a framework. You buy, I mean, Henry, Henry is a, uh, an engineer. We have maybe some other engineers here. My undergrad is engineering. When you put up the framework, you know, in many ways, there's so much uh, potential and, and diversity that you can put in the building, yet the framework limits you in some ways, okay? And so in, in the same way, biblical, biblical theology, once we identify, we clearly see those frameworks, when we clearly see those fundamental truths, they will help guide us in our interpretation to what you're saying. It's not specifically mentioned in the New Testament, but it seems to be pointing... Um, 
that's when that's when we can go to the framework and 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 the you see that that framework in the early church fathers not that they're not that they're they're inspired not that they're not fallible but they're but they're but they're also operating from a from a framework so they're even adding to what the apostles said and so we should be following um both of their examples um and of course not um, um, we want to say, so this is critical, exegetical theology. So what we're not doing is we're not reinterpreting the Old Testament, okay? It's in exegetical, exegetical theology. So, so our interpretation, it's still contained in the Old Testament, okay? So it's not reinterpreting. It's not abolishing it. <laughs> we'll discuss that later. It's not ignoring it. It's, 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 it's still in that exegetical, when we say exegesis, just for those who maybe are new, um, that's drawing out from the original context um, uh, troops, troops, okay? Um, any other questions before we go on? Any other questions or comments? Okay, let's move on here. Let's move on here. Uh, next we have, so, so now that we've defined biblical theology, we do need to look at it in relationship to the other theologies. And there are some questions there, so I, I do want to spend some time here. And I have a graphic. <laughs> so I have a picture for us. All right, so um, the other, the other, um, there are there are roughly there are roughly four major areas of of theology. Okay, there's ma four major disciplines, and then of course you can have other disciplines, um, and so uh, those other disciplines can kind of fit within these. Um, you know, I don't want to get into a debate of all the different disciplines. This is more or less the big the big the four big ones. Okay. Um, and in fairness, there could be others, and maybe we want, we want to debate that again in another class. So the four ones are exegetical theology, systematic theology, historical theology, and practical theology. And that's what Voss says. These are the four biggies. These are the four biggies. From these departments, from these fields, you can have other areas. So within practical theology, you can have discipleship. Within practical theology, you can have counseling. Within practical theology, you can have pastoral theology okay so there's there's a lot of other subcategories to these theologies okay um let me just i'm going to read slowly i, I i'm not going to put this up on the board but i'm going to read slowly just a brief definition of each one of these and so um um exegetical theology is the study of what the text actually says okay so if you could say exegetical theology in a nutshell you're really drawing out the full meaning of what the text itself says. Systematic theology is the study of what the inter is the study of what the eternal truths that Scripture teaches. So you could say it's what the it's what the text means. <laughs> okay, so it's like the full it's it's looking at all the different studies within exegetical theology and now we're drawing up eternal uh, eternal truths okay so it's uh, think of it also as what how it sounds it's a system it's systematizing okay it's systematizing so it's it's taking all the different studies in the different exegetical passages and now we're going to draw up greater truths okay and that's why that's why exegetical theology you'll have like you know we'll give examples but it's it's within it's verse by verse but systematic it doesn't go verse by verse it goes by topic it goes by topic you'll have a topic as a category and then all the proof text for that topic and all the major different statements for that topic um another example of systematic theology at a very core level so we have this very early in the church history is is confessions a confession of faith a confession of faith is a systematic theology at a most fundamental level so for example the apostles creed would be a a systematic theology at a very at a very foundational level okay historical theology is not looking at theology in the bible okay now you could say, oh, well, you just you just said the history of Revelation, Tim. Like, what are you talking about? Okay, fair enough. But we're looking at these disciplines in the context of church history, okay? So historical theology is looking at the different views of systematic theology 
in church history. <laughs> so, so we could say it's the, the history of systematic theology. So think about historical the theology as the history of systematic theology. Okay, so that's the big difference. We could also say how the, the, the church developed theology in church history. So it's the development of our theology. So, for example, the Apostles' Creed is very uh, rudimentary. It's very basic, whereas the later creeds and confessions are much more are much more detailed. And for those of you who have done your own your own uh, uh, doctrinal statement preparation, I heard at CGST you guys are preparing those. Um, it's going to be much more involved than your the Apostles' Creed, right? Lastly, practical theology. Practical theology is uh, the application of those eternal truths in our contemporary context. Okay? So as a discipline, practical theology is applying those eternal truths of systematics, what is right, and we're applying those in our specific context. So counseling, discipleship, uh, preaching, teaching, small groups, um, worship styles. That is all practical theology. Not that it's less important. Many times we'll say practical theology is less important. Not that it's less important. Not that it's, not that it's, uh, it's, it's, it's less deep than systematic. It's just applied. So let's use a parallel example. Um, imagine I'm an engineer, so I'm always going to use engineering illustrations, okay? Imagine mathematics mathematics is more along the lines of exegetical and systematic and then engineering is along the lines of practical theology engineering is applied mathematics right henry am i right so in many ways listen to me in many ways practical theology is the most challenging it is the most challenging because you're taking you're taking those principles those truths and you're applying it you're applying it okay mathematicians many times they're just they're off in their own why why do we need math just for the beauty well of course it's beautiful but we use math because we're going to use it practically and so uh biblical theology is in the exegetical we're going to look at that but i don't want you to think about it be thinking about biblical theology also as being uh here we go. This is, the, this is the image I want us to see here. There it is. Uh, practical theology is the pinnacle. Practical theology is the pinnacle. But if you don't have the foundation and the structure of systematic and historical, your building will collapse. So th there's a lot more work in the foundation. It's a lot bigger. And so this pyramid is by design this is by design the more you you spend in the exegetical the easier it will be to build on the systematic and then the practical okay um and Cy Young, if you don't build on them your your, your pyramid is like a, a mound <laughs> but 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 the the foundation is so critical now um from our definition before, Voss says that biblical theology is within the field of exegetical theology. So it's so fundamental. So now we're going to go and look in the foundation. So here's another picture I have. I hope you can see it. So now we're going into we're going into the different areas of exegetical theology so that you can see that biblical theology is one of many. It's one of many components. These are all interacting together as part of exegetical theology. So they include, these are different sub-disciplines, okay? Commentary on the text, introductions or Bible surveys, uh, canonical studies, uh, New Testament, Old Testament theology, and then you have biblical theology, okay? So these are all within, still considered the realm of exegetical theology, or biblical studies, okay? Any questions or comments? I hope this makes sense. Let's take a minute to ask to ask some questions here.
Okay, what's the time? I think it's 15. All right, we're, we're back. We're back. So I hope that you were able to go to the bathroom and get some uh, a drink. Let's move on here. I hope this is making sense. I know we're belaboring the point here. I'm, I'm just I'm trying to help us to see all these relationships. This will become very familiar to you, and this will be very helpful. The more you read, the better you're, you'll be able to understand um, in, in reading on, on, on the internet when people have discussions. So let, let's move on here now. The, the next point I want us to see here is, uh, so Voss will talk about major characteristics of biblical theology. So he's going to define major characteristics. Okay, there's more, there's more than this. There can be more than this, but this is, these are the most fundamental. And these, these are important for us to consider. So uh, the first major characteristic from the reading is the historic progressiveness of the revelation process. So there is a progression in which God is, re is, is revealing, um, revealing to us his will, his word, and what he wants us to know. So there is this, there is this um, progressive nature. So just a couple, a couple quotations here from Voss to give us some more insight. insight. Uh, and this is what we discussed before. So this is just a review. I really want to ingrain this. Revelation does not stand alone um, by itself, but is inseparably attached to the other activity of God, which we call redemption. So the two are present. The two are present. Moving along here further, we have this statement. Uh, revelation is the interpretation of redemption. So I think Kaya mentioned that earlier tonight. Um, and, and I gave the example of the gospel. Um, uh, redemption always accompanies always accompanies, um, revelation always accompanies redemption. And so we talked about that. I don't want to belabor this point. We're, we're going to go somewhere. I'll, I'll give you a, a, a big picture that we can discuss um, more in a bit. Um, and then uh, there needs to be within this idea of historic progressiveness, there, are, there, there needs to be a distinction, objective central acts and subjective individual acts. Okay, so I hope that you picked up on this in the reading. This is absolutely fundamental to redemption. And so I have some examples here that Voss gives us, and I think I added some as well. So we're looking at the comparison between objective central and then also subjective individual. And so here are some, here are some objective central acts that can never be repeated. This is just one time in this progress of revelation and redemption. The Exodus. There's only one literal Exodus from Egypt to, to Canaan. The exile, that is from Israel going to Babylon, Assyria. There's only one exile. There's only one crucifixion. Can never be replicated again. These are Objective central acts, resurrection, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Uh, one time, right? One time only, okay? Um, Pentecost, within this, within this framework, Diba Pentecost is one time. The giving of the Spirit in, in a profound way is part of these objective central acts. Pentecost can never be repeated. And so maybe we would say amen to Exodus. Maybe we would say amen to exile. Maybe we would say amen to crucifixion. Pentecost is like, <laughs> you know, so Pentecost cannot be repeated. The, the church being given, the, 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 the Holy Spirit falling upon the church in, in a objective, central, historical event happens one time. Does that mean that we can't take some form of application from that event? Of course not. We can take application for sure from Exodus. We can take application from exile and from the crucifixion in, in, in some sense, right? But the event happens one time and it can never be repeated. And so we have to be very careful with, you know, we don't pray for another crucifixion. 
but sometimes we pray for another Pentecost, right? And that doesn't mean that we can't pray that God's spirit would move in a, in, in, in a special way, okay? I'm not, I'm not saying that. But I am saying that some people in, in theology, in the church, will actually pray for the Pentecost to happen again. And it can't. It can't happen again. Um, so this is why the framework is so fundamental for us to understand. We need to distinguish the objective central from the subjective individual. So what are the subjective individual acts? Regeneration <laughs> happens many times and it happens on an individual basis, okay? Justification, many times, right? Of course, it's one time for us, but it's individual. Just the act of justification happens many times for each individual. There's a time in which we are brought into peace with God, okay? Um, uh, conversion, sanctification. So Christ's resurrection, one time. Our resurrection, glorification, many times in all of the different lives of the believer, okay? So in this progressive revelation, we need to really be, one of these fundamental parts of biblical theology is recognizing this distinction. It's going to be very helpful for us. And it makes sense. It makes sense why some things are objective and other things seem to be subjective. And so sometimes when you confuse, you can, you can have a deficient theology. Number two point, number two point. Sorry for the confusion. Please forgive me. Uh, I'm still working with this text, so I'm a little bit behind here. So the, 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 sec so the first major characteristic of biblical, biblical theology is the, is the progressive many event revelation to us. And there's some key components there. The second is the actual embodiment of revelation in history. The actual embodiment of revelation in history. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. The process of revelation is not only associated with history, but actually becomes incarnate in history. So think about this for a second. Again, I'm going to be talking about theology, okay? And maybe it seems like I'm, I'm hitting on one type of theological perspective, Maybe you picked up on it. I'm not meaning to, um, um, but maybe we can see this. If we're looking at revelation, special revelation, God speaking to us, and it's happening in various ways and various means and various manners, and then his revelation actually becomes incarnate, right? Of course, God's spirit dwells us and speaks to us, but why would we go back? Why would we go back to wanting visions? Why would we want to go back to these other unclear special forms of revelation when we have his son? Does everyone see what I'm trying to get at here? Going back to these other modes, these other ways, it's like you're going, you know, you, you're going to the big five course meal, right? You're going to the to the to the to the to the party, the fiesta, right? And they have the door appetizers. Maybe there's some chips. Maybe there's some drinks. But you never go into the lechon. Or you go in and you have the lechon. And then you're going back to the chips. <laughs> Why would we do that? <laughs> you know, in the U.S., you have the, the door appetizers. They're like maybe like little, like little bread things. And then you go to the filet mignon. It's like, I'm never going back to the chips. I'm never going back to the, to the bread, okay? And so what I'm trying to get at here is that in theology today, there's this temptation to, I'm praying for a word from God. I'm praying for this vision from God. And people are sincere. I'm not attacking the sincerity. I'm not saying it's malevolent. I'm not saying that it's evil. But from a framework perspective, God's revelation has become flesh and we have that revelation now in, 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 in his living word in the New Testament. 
and then the Spirit speaks to us through it. Why would we go to any other mode? Why would we seek any other mode? Could God perhaps speak? Perhaps, yes. But from a, from a, a, a just a thinking about, about um, where our focus should be, it's, it's on the living word. It, it's on the living word as revealed to us in the New Testament. And as the Spirit testifies and teaches us. So I, I hope that you really see this. Biblical theology is not peripheral. It's not like, oh, it's deep theology. We don't, we need it. Because that's our bread and butter. That's our filet mignon. That's our lechon. Okay. Uh, and so here we're going also to this, again, the, the act revelation. So God's acts are a form of revelation. We'll also see that as we work through the book. And then the word revelation. <laughs> so again, these are the, the two. God reveals himself in word and he reveals himself in act. And this is coming back to the redemption, the redemption, the redemption uh, revelation motif. And so Voss says, now this is my, this is my interpretation. I'm adding a little bit to Voss. Uh, facts require a revealing significance. The cross and resurrection require the explanation and proclamation of the gospel. You cannot have the cross without the gospel. That is the proclaiming of it, the revealing of the gospel. You cannot have the gospel without the cross. <laughs> Think about if we only saw the event without the explanation. We'd be debating it. We'd be lost. That's why Voss says the two are inseparable. They are, they are inseparable, but left and right hand, but inseparable. They're inseparable. What would, this be, what would be the significance of Jesus' work if it was not revealed to us? So big picture. Here we go. Big picture. So this is what Voss says. I've read it in other places. A lot of people are pulling this from Voss. So if you've read this some other place, it's coming from Voss. You know, maybe in earlier church history, he pulled it from someone. Someone asked a question about notes. We'll get to that later. We'll get to that later, okay? Um, uh, uh, great question, though, for about, about, about the notes. Um, uh, big picture. The Old Testament brings the predictive preparatory word. It's promise. The gospel records the redemptive act, the act of God. The epistles supply the final interpretation. This is the framework. This is the big picture here, okay? So when you look at this big picture, we, we have to understand if we're studying Deuteronomy, it's, it's preparatory. If... <laughs> We're studying on the Sabbath. It's preparatory. It's preparatory for what's going to happen in the future, okay? The epistles are going to really, what Pastor Anting said earlier, they're going to really help explain the gospel events and also the Old Testament preparation, okay? All three of these are, they are inseparable, 1 Corinthians 15 says that Paul wants to uh, proclaim to them the gospel uh, in which they stand, by which they are being saved. Uh, if you hold fast to what I proclaim to you, it is this, that Christ died. Now, we, we all proclaim Christ died for our, your sins, right? Do we focus on Christ died for your sins in accordance with the scriptures. That prepositional phrase should just take on whole new meaning for you. In accordance with the scriptures. And he rose again, and Paul says it again, in accordance with the scriptures. And that's a reference to the Old Testament. That's a reference to the Old Testament. Any questions or thoughts? Let's take a moment here. Questions, comments. If you want to add, let's let's. If you want to add something, go ahead. Anything, go ahead.
uh, in, in the book, um, this part, the actual embodiment of revelation in history. <clears throat> and yes, he, he's talking about act revelation and word revelation. I have a question here. He said, um, however, uh, should be remembered in this connection. First, that these two sides, Acts did not take primarily for the purpose of revelation. The revelatory character is secondary. Primarily they possess, so primarily they possess a purpose that transcends revelation. And that is having a God word reference in their effect. And only in dependence on this, a man word reference for instruction. So I wanna clarify what he meant by this. Is, is he saying, that the primary thing is about glorifying God or displaying who God is yeah. before applying it to every individual yeah. or before anybody can learn or uh, that we human being will understand this is secondary to God displaying himself. Yes, yes, okay. that, that, that is a good interpretation of what he's saying. And that, that is completely in line, that is completely in line with a God-centered perspective on scripture scriptures is is primarily about god and not about man uh and in the confession uh you know we don't agree with everything in the westminster confession but there's some good stuff in there the, the chief of end of man to to glorify and enjoy god forever so this is it is god word focus and so revelation even in redemption even in redemption it is primarily a god it's for god it's the, it's for the exaltation of the creator. It's not for the creation in and of ourself. So a, a very specific passage that we can draw to is, I'll just read it here. Romans chapter 11 and verse, uh, third, I'll read 33 to, to 36. Now we would expect, now let me, let me just be clear. God loves us. God cares for us. God God deeply loves us and he cares for his creatures. So I'm not minimizing that, but look at the big picture here. Oh, the depths of the riches and wisdom of, and the knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments, how inscrutable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counselor or who has given him a gift to be repaid? Who has, who has Uthag? <laughs> Of God, right? God has who talk to no one, right? Um, for, for, from him and through him and to him are all things. And that would, uh, to him be glory forever, amen. And that would necessarily include his revelation. It's all about him. And only after we have that framework can we then apply it. And that's what Voss is is. And that's how I interpret it, as, as you are interpreting. Yeah, excellent. Uh, Glenn, go ahead. Um, this, this big picture, looking at this big picture, I think it's a great representation. And I think the real challenge on the ground, real challenge on the ground, and this is, I guess, taking place um, more within, within, you know, in-house, yeah. within, among us, is, you know, this challenge of some people wanting to be able to have a level of authority to say, God told me. Yeah. So instead of like taking the epistles, taking the gospels and, you know, reading the epistles and taking that as, okay, here we go. I mean, just understand this. This is final interpretation. God has revealed his will, but I think humanly speaking, you know, some people would just like to be able to say, you know what? I heard from God. God told yeah. me, you know, and yeah. and that gives a sense of, you know, some level of authority and some level of credibility. Yeah, yeah. You know. So rather than and and that's that's where we have problems all the time. Yeah. <laughs> that's where we have problems all the time. No. Yeah. Yeah. Ec excellent point, Glenn. That's and, and it, that's that that comes back to this man centered that they want this intrinsic authority, and it can be even it can be even with good motives. It can be with good motives, you know. And, and I just I'm going to piggyback what Glenn said. I'm going to I'm going to run with what Glenn said because it was such a good statement. 
You know, you look at the gospel as described in Galatians. Paul says, even if an angel of light comes to you and say this, yeah. it's different than the gospel. You're, yeah. That's a curse. It's like the gospel, the gospel revelation trumps even an angel. <laughs> yeah, excellent point, Glenn. Excellent, excellent observation. Anyone else want to add? Anyone else want to get in on this goodness here? Go ahead. Go ahead. I think it was Danny was raising his hand. So, Tim, uh, Pastor Tim, there's, there's no more new revelation. Yes. 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 That is correct. We can say emphatically with the coming of Christ, and we're going to get... Hopefully we get to that. So, so again, this is more, again, we're dealing with statements. You're seeing the big picture. We do still want to get into the word of God. So where in scripture, maybe you saw it in your homework, maybe you saw it in your homework, where in scripture was it emphatic that, that God uh, has spoken, has spoken, okay? Um, uh, let's, let's go on. So, so I'm going to wet your whistle there and we'll just, we'll just, we'll, we'll I'd say. I'd say Hebrews. I say Hebrews chapter one, for instance. Oh, man. Someone's done the homework already, or someone's just yeah. It's 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 a it's a it's a fundamental passage. Excellent, excellent uh, foreshadow there, Glenn. Good. Um, we're, we're, we'll get to that passage. Uh, let's let's move on here. So, um, what's the time? I want to see the time here. Okay, let's go. It's um, we're we're in good shape here. Uh, continuing on. So again, I'm just I'm I'm highlighting what what boss is saying here. So number three. Major characteristics of biblical theology, the organic nature, the organic nature of the historic process observable revelation. I might have a typo there, but maybe not. The organic nature of the historic process of observable revelation. Maybe I should put an, a, an of there. Um, so this organic, this organic relationship here, okay? Voss says, Voss says, he describes it for us. The organic progress is from seed form to the attainment of full growth, the flower. Okay? So my, my picture my picture of the seed and flower is not original to me. Uh, what what the, the picture we should think about for Revelation is the seed that produces the flower. The genetic makeup, everything, maybe that's a little bit anachronistic because boss is, you know, maybe pre-genetic genes, but nonetheless, everything comes from the seed. And so in that sense, it's the same, you know, I think we can add the genetic makeup. Everything in the seed is there, right? There's a time in which it grows and then it comes to full blossom in the flower. You could say the flower looks so different than the seed, but everything's there. It's just brought. And so this is a big takeaway here. Um, let me read this here, and then I'm, I'm going to give you a big takeaway. I'm going to give you a big takeaway, okay? Um, there is no qualitative difference between the seed and the tree. The seed contains all the genetic information that brings about the tree. The only difference is the outward manifestation at any point in time. So big takeaway here. Again, big takeaway. You can take this to the bank, okay? Okay. Um, God hasn't revealed everything to us. He is revealing things to us, but he's not bringing them into existence, okay? When we say progress of revelation, he's just slowly revealing what is already true. So it's not a different way of redemption. It's not a different plan of salvation. It's not a different plan uh, in the grand scheme of things. God is just slowly unfolding what was in plan from the beginning. And so this is big. This is big. This could be big in, in our in practically for, for us as a church, but also later liberals, liberalism is coming to the Philippines. Uh, the big, the big uh, thing now within, so this is where we need to be careful and within more liberal biblical theology. They will say it doesn't matter if the original context has Christ, the New Testament reinterpreted Christ, and that was God's. That's 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 God's plan. It's fine, and we want to say no, 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 no. According to the scriptures, it's only revealing. It's not reinterpretation. It's not. It's not a. Oh man, this was the plan. You know, didn't work out so well. I got a. I got a bigger and better plan over here for us, right? It's 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 no. It's it's coming. 
uh, in the words of Rams Goldsworthy, another good book you can read, according to plan. <laughs> it's going according to plan. Um, any comments or questions here? If someone want to add? Go ahead. Team for a better, I think Marcus is about to say something. So, okay, because... Marcus, go ahead. Mark. Oh, thank you, Pastor, Pastor Enting. You first. <laughs> Yeah, just for a better understanding on, on this thing for everybody's sake. So, so we're talking about, we are saying that if I'm an engineer, because we have been using the, 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 the illustration of an engineer. So if you're an engineer and you already have the blueprint of what you intend to do, and so so we're saying that that even in the groundwork uh, that it is progressively built, but everything is pointing towards the bigger picture yeah. of, of what God intended to to do as far as our redemption is concerned. Yes, yes, yes. No, that's really good. And so, I mean, you know, yeah, absolutely. So it's not it's not a change. It's not an oh. This is, it's going to be like this now. It's no, this is going exactly as, as it was planned in the blueprint. And we'd say the blueprint is God's, God's uh, uh, divine will, God's divine will. And so that goes back to eternity. Okay. So that's why Christ can be called the lamb slain before the foundation of the earth, of the world. Okay. E excellent, excellent uh, practical description ending uh mark go ahead um uh, pastor team uh, uh you've mentioned earlier uh with regards to the revelation you've mentioned earlier that there is no any other revelation according uh, uh aside from the bible right yes but uh, but if that is the case where is the sovereignty of god um I'm not tracking on the the connection there, or maybe just elaborate a little bit. So you're saying that if Revelation is climax in Christ, it's ended in Christ, and of course his apostles because they were sent by him. You're saying where would where would the sovereignty of God be? Can you that connection there? Um, yes, because we uh, I uh, you've mentioned earlier, Pastor Danny asked about it that. He said that um, there is no revelation, new revelation. Yeah. Sorry, sorry. And and if that's the case, according to God's sovereignty, uh, where can where can we find the will of God to talk to us on His own will? Oh, so so is your question, Mark, in our specific like? Our specific life? Uh, yes, in okay. any forms, outside okay. the Bible. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to try to, I'll repeat, clarify me if I'm wrong. So I think what your question is, is that if God's revelation is brought to an end now, um, um, how does God speak to us, especially in like our daily life? Is, 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 that, is that the question? Yes, yes. Yeah, so... so um, so when I say that God's special revelation is brought to an end, that is not to say that, that um, God cannot speak to us through the Holy Spirit, okay? But I would hope that we all would agree that, that when you're looking at um, uh, uh, God's, spe God's special revelation concerning um, Him speaking regardless of how we want to say God speaks to us now, um, we're, we're going to get to this text. So, so maybe, maybe we can hold off on your question, but um, uh, um, he, ha he has spoken past tense in his son, uh, Hebrews 1, 2. Okay. So um, in these last days, so, so we have to at least acknowledge that's a reality, right? That that's true. Um, how do we, how do we 
understand God still speaking because his, his Holy Spirit is, is with us today. So my practical answer would be for, for you is that God still speaks to us, but it's his spirit bearing witness to us through his word. Okay, so in that sense, there still is not any new revelation. There's no new revelation being given to us, okay? So God leading us to a specific task, the calling of being a pastor, is still within the context of what he's revealed in his will. It's not, it's not new revelation in, in the traditional sense. We'll, 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 look at, we'll look at that definition of revelation first. Is that kind of clarifying, Mark, or, or am I not really getting at your question? So we'll go, we'll go Glenn it. first and then Sonny. Glenn, go ahead. Yeah, if, if I may, I think um, I think we we have to perhaps it will it will be helpful to remind ourselves that when what we're talking about biblical revelation, biblical theology, we're talking about in the context of God, in the context of redemption, in the context yeah. of yes. what God has planned for mankind. Yeah. That's done in Christ. That's completed in Christ. Uh, so God is no longer revealing any kind of work, any kind of new thing that he's doing yeah. to save us from our sins, yeah. you know, how, how to get us to heaven, how to become his yeah. children, all of those things. He's revealed those things already. I like, no, here's the thing. I like what you're saying. I, I'm going to piggyback Glenn. So what Glenn is saying is that I'm going to bring in boss. And so it's really good, Glenn. So what Glenn is saying is that because revelation and redemption are inseparable, when redemption is done, so is revelation. So that's that's going back to this framework perspective. And we're going to look at the scriptural basis in, in Hebrews 1.1. 1, 1. In these last days, he, he has spoken to us through his son. And so so that is, is a biblical reference. Again, you know, I, in some ways, we're dealing with the text before we go to the scripture. So I, I, for those of you who really are... are Want to get to the text? Do not worry. We are going to get there. So I, I, I really like what Glenn was saying. Uh, Sonny, um, did you want to add to this? Did you want to add to this? Yeah, actually, um, I, I suppose to uh, make a clarity of what what Mark is trying to say. But uh, he, he already explained by uh, Sivlin. So um, I think this this is also a controversial today. Like there are so many pastors which in new revelations, like we don't care about the Bible anymore because, you know, I have my new revelations because this is also true here in the Philippines. And even some would say that they are Baptist church, but still they, they believe in the new revelations right now, here and now. So, yeah. So um, how do we address this in our churches like that? If, 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 if there is no revelation, if, I mean, if the Bible is really complete and then uh, we have this problem in our churches right now about this uh, kind of uh, they would say millennial prophets or new prophet or apostle so and so, and they believe that that prophet and some kind uh, they believe that it, this prophet it's like more authoritative than the scripture, you know. So so are you referring to Kabuloy? Uh, not only Kabuloy, but there are so many churches that in here in the Philippines uh, they are they are in the evangelical circle, but still believe in the new mm -hmm. revelation like. I believe in prophet according to prophet so and so this is what they see uh this is what the you know a, a revelation that comes from him and i truly believe that yeah. there are so many i know some some you know claiming to be an evangelical christians and believe so, that so yeah so let's do this can yeah. we just because I, I i i in many ways it's really so there's two there's there's two ways to get at it with you practically speaking number one the framework which is we're setting up the framework so i'm giving you big picture type framework and and we would say yes that's absolutely true you know why would we look to any other type of revelation when god's word has become incarnate that's crazy right why, why would we go to some other type of vague revelation when in time and space god's word has become flesh number one and number two hebrews 1 1 says he has spoken okay so but let's 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 table that question and let's come back to it once we can get into the text, because I do think that we can talk about the framework with, with our members, and then we can also talk about the text. Okay, text is more important because from the text we're getting we're getting the framework. But in many ways, again, we're still in the introductory phase. So let's let's table that question 
Mark and Sonny, really good. Let's be thinking about that throughout the semester. We will continue to come back. And, I, and because we're dealing with the history of special revelation, I, I, I feel like this will continue to crop up, okay? And, and I think that we will, be, we will develop a, a cumulative uh, uh, argument. And I do want it to be fundamentally in the scripture. And so right now we're still, we're not there yet. So, so in some ways I, I, want, I, want, I want to hold off on that. Um, anyone else want to ask a question not related to that because we're tabling that question? Anyone else want to add a comment? Oh yeah. well, uh, it has something to do with the question of uh, Danny, if there's a new revelation or there's a new revelation, and then the comment of Mark and the comment of Glenn. I think they are, they, they are interrelated. If we put that in uh, Siguro in, uh, in a certain context, that when Christ was revealed to us, that was the end of the revelation because that's the end of the revelation. That is what I understood from Glenn that after Jesus appeared, that completed the revelation process because that's the redemption process because that's the end of revelation is the redemption. So when Danny asked that there will be no, that means there is no more new revelations, probably that is referring to that, that aspect that since God has already revealed himself through Christ Jesus, then there will be no more other Christ, quote unquote. Because if somebody is still waiting for another Christ, then they're waiting for a new revelation. But if we believe that Jesus Christ is the revelation, then we don't expect a new revelation in that sense. Yes. So yeah. I agree that, uh, I agree with them that uh, this is the the, 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 the the end of the revelation. But I also agree that uh, since there is still time from now up to the second coming, there will be revelation. But I also do not agree that there will be some prophet like Kiboloi or other prophets who will claim that God revealed to me these things, these things, these things, these things and prophet. That is what uh, I would like to point in this in this in this uh, discussion. Yeah, great, great point, Koya Bulboy. And actually, to, to add a caveat in, in accordance with Koya Bulboy, there, there, because we're, at the end of the day, we're talking about more Pentecostal and charismatic theology. Let's let's, let's just name it as it is. Okay, so there are more moderate, very fair. You know, Wayne Grudem is within. I, lo I love Wayne Grudem. He is a great theologian, but he's, he's a, he is a moderate Pentecostal, and he believes in, in still the gift of prophecy, etc. So what Wayne Grudem will say is that there's two different levels. The revelation, the special revelation is brought to them. No, there's no new revelation. There's no new prophet, but then there can be specific, less level type revelation. But I think that's more where where, where Boy is talking about. Again, let, let's... Uh, let's go ahead and let's put a hold on this until after later, later in the class because I think we can come back to this. And, and there's, yeah, maybe we can have a class on this. Okay, we can have a class on. We don't, so, anyone else want to add, or, or we can move on? Anyone else want to add? I don't want to cut anyone off. Kim, are you jumping already to the next to the fourth characteristic? Uh, I'm getting ready to, yes. Yeah, yeah. So, I, so I just want to, to insert here because a boss is talking about multiformity um, here in this characteristic. And, and in this multiformity, he cited that, uh, um, to quote him, he said, if Paul has one point of view and Peter another, then each can be at best only approximately correct and uh, I'm trying to understand Voss here um, and, and, and the best possible way to understand Voss here is to see it in a different angle but you're seeing a dis the same truth um, but, but on the other hand I see the somehow uh, danger of of getting it and using it to to prove that that uh, there is no absolute truth, even Peter and 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 Paul uh, can differ as to their understanding of of the truth. How, how can we make sense of of this? Yeah. No. So so excellent point. I think someone else. Maybe that was your maybe that was your uh, reflection paper that brought up. So. Thank you for bringing. Thank you for bringing that up. I forgot. Um, 
excellent question. And, and that was also, so we have to understand Voss's context. Voss is in Princeton, Semin uh, Princeton University Seminary, which has already become liberal, okay? Um, conservative scholars left, B.B. Warfare and Voss stayed, okay? And so in some ways, Voss maybe is a little bit influenced or he's trying to be as objective as possible because he wants his, his positions to be accepted by his liberal counterparts, okay? So from an apologetic perspective, he's trying to be as fair as possible to get credit from them, okay? And that would be my interpretation. Maybe there's another reason there. That's one, that's one possible. And so I would say that would be more of a, a critique that I would have. So, so I think your caution is very well-founded. Um, another possibility, and, and I was listening to uh, John Frame, and I really like what he said. He said that when, 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 when we talk about approximate truth, so like Voss talks about, you know, if Peter and Paul disagree, it's both approximate. He also talks about in scripture, right? He says, at what level is scripture absolute truth? And so what he wants to say is that um, we can talk about approximate truth in a context and still speak about absolute truth. So the example he gave, he gives is that if I'm speaking with you and you ask me my age, okay, um, I would say I am 37, okay? Um, would I be wrong? No, in, in, in our context, I'm being accurate and it makes sense. Now, technically speaking, I'm 37 years uh, um, and uh, I'm going to mess this up and like, and like 18 days. Okay. So in a, in an absolute true sense, I'm wrong, but in a contextual sense, I'm right. And so a lot of times the biblical authors are speaking in that contextual sense, but not in an ultimate sense. And, and I think in, in, that's another way of viewing what Voss is trying to say that, um, you know, um, Maybe Peter is, you know, the, the big thing is James and is James and and Paul on works and, and justification. And so one solution is to say, you know, Paul is dealing with, you know, you don't really synthesize the two. Paul is dealing with one contextual issue and James is dealing with another. They're both agreeing. And maybe boss is saying it's, you know, it's not absolute. Now, I would not want to go down. I would want to synthesize and I would not speak in that language. And I don't think we should speak in the language that boss because of those dangers. Okay. Um, but there, are, but there are some case for apologetic reasons. So for example, the, the death of Christ was, was um, being buried in the ground for three days. It wasn't three full, full days. It was three parts of a day. I mean, it was parts of three days, right? So I could, I could, I could begin a job for Henry. I could start on Monday afternoon, engineering job. I work all Tuesday, and then I finish on Wednesday morning, and he pays me for three days, right? I work three days for Henry. What, did you work three full days? No. Oh, he's a liar. No, well, the job was approximately three days, and, and so we're speaking in context. So that's another way of reading what he's trying to say. You know, I do think it's more of the first. He's trying to be as objective and, and I do, I would say that we should not, we, we, you know, that would be something I would, I would, I would disagree with Voss at the same time. Um, you know, I, 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 it's like you said, uh, maybe someone can, maybe someone can add some input. Yeah. If I may, if I may, if I may comment on that uh, theme. Maybe the concern of Sunny is, uh, is it Sunny or? Okay. Anything, it's fine, yeah, go ahead. Uh, anything, anything. Maybe the concern of anything is the matter of style. Because if we look at their background, uh, Paul was the more educated type. So he was talking a very deep doctrinal issues while Peter being not so educated, couldn't touch on that very deep doctrinal issues. That's why there's a difference in the way they approach a certain truth about God. Yeah. So yeah. It's just a matter of style. But they speak of the same thing. They are talking of the same Jesus. So how could it be different? How could it be interpreted differently? But I, so I think, I think the concern is when he says approximate truth. That approximate truth, that doesn't sit well for me. And, and because I've read a lot, and I think that it's more trying to really 
it's trying to get credit from the more liberals. I do think that's probably a, a fair reading. And I, I would not speak like that. And I would like our positions from liberal from a liberal higher critical view, they would really, they would really laugh at us. And so when we talk about approximate truth, maybe they're like, okay, maybe, maybe it's better. So I think that's probably closer. Um, but what you're saying, Koya Boboy, is you're synthesizing, and I would agree with your synthesis. We would agree with it. It's just that 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 language is uh, is a little rough. Red, do you want to say yeah. something? Red. And then, and then sorry, Red. Uh, I think this is a different question, but it's still related to uh, this topic, the organic nature of historic process of cerebral in Revelation. Uh, this just popped out when I, when I did the scripture reading reflection. Uh, in Hebrews chapter 8, verse 7, it said, uh, for if there had been nothing wrong with the first covenant, um, I just want to ask the question, uh, does this refer to like because biblical religion, this refer the first covenant does this refer to the old testament like scriptures right the old testament scriptures but specifically the old covenant system so it's, uh, okay, right. it's, it's the old covenant as a system yeah yeah so my question is uh it is not necessarily it does, it does not mean that there's something wrong with like if, if that's the seed it's not, it's not saying that the old testament or the old covenant the seed is wrong uh is it right when I interpret it as, no, not as I interpret, I think about it as uh, there's something wrong with how the people uh, were, the author Hebrews is writing, is thinking about the, the first covenant. Uh, it's not that the word of God is wrong. It's just that, yeah, because the, the wording in, in the Bible says, yeah. not true, and then in Psalm chapter 19, it says the law of God is, yeah. is perfect, so. So, 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 Red, let's come back to that question when we work through there. And throughout this semester, we will really engage in that. What I would say is that the, the Old Covenant was deficient by design. So that's what he's referring to, the deficiency. But it's by design because it's a type or a shadow. I just, I'm going to put it on a hold there because we're going to go there. So uh, Glenn and then, oh, sorry, Enting, then Glenn. So, so Enting, go ahead, and then, and then Glenn. Yeah, I'm okay. I, I just want to make clear that I was not critiquing Paul or Peter, but the book, but uh, uh, pause in his yeah. comment. Yep, yep. Yeah, yeah. No, and, and, I, and I think, yeah. Good, good, good. So, so just, yeah, Enting was critiquing the comment, but that's something we would disagree with. So that was good. That was good, Enting. Yeah, good. Um, so next we have here, uh, the last major characteristic of biblical theology is a practical it's a practical so our biblical theology we're going deep but it must be practical to know and to love god and boss is saying to know is is equated with to love and that's really that's really true and we don't have time to go into all of the uh, we can use that we can we can discuss that in another course but essentially we would all agree that the goal of biblical theology is to know and love god the great shema and also, um, uh, what Jesus said in, in, in John 17, I think three and four, um, and this is eternal life to know uh, the one true God and, and, and his son, something like that. I, I, I'm paraphrasing. I'm sorry. I'm paraphrasing. Okay. Um, let's move on here. The circle of revelation, I love this, I love this, is not a school, but a covenant. That's not to say that there was not school things that there was, there is not discipling going on. Jesus discipled. Um, but fundamentally, what, what boss is saying is fundamentally revelation is about a covenant, not a school. If we are doing this only for knowledge, if we're doing this only for prestige, for success, sayang talaga. It's, it's fundamentally a covenant, and we're going to look at covenant. So we're going to look at covenant, and we're going to look at covenant throughout the semester. So um, never fear, never fear. Um, okay. Um, guiding principles. I'm going to go through this quick, and then we're going to take our break. Okay, guiding principles here. Uh, number one. So, oh, my goodness. So I'll refer you to, to, to boss. We can also discuss on the break, but 
recognition of the infall infallible character of revelation. So a guiding principle, and we would all agree with this, but Voss is really in a liberal context where they would not, his students would not. And so he says, we have to have this infallible character of revelation. You could say, Tim, this is like, this is like one-on-one, of course. And, but, but Voss did not have that. He's fighting the battle. He's fighting the battle with his, in his liberal context. And so he's putting that rightly at the most fundamental for guiding principles. Number two, recognition of objectivity of the groundwork of revelation. So this is really also clarifying Enting's uh, concern that Voss is not playing with liberalism, okay? He's not playing with it. He's not playing with it. You know, he's trying to give credit where credit's due, but he, he says you have to recognize the objectivity of the groundwork of revelation. Um, number three, biblical theology and the foundation of inspiration. So these are, again, as we read through them, these are our guides. So it guides our interpretation. So if you if you recall, or maybe you haven't you 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 you, you have you haven't read there yet, but he's going to keep going back to the to the the Pentateuch school and Wellhausen, I think it is, um, uh, <laughs> liberal that that is reinterpreting the history of of, of Israel and giving a, a purely rationalistic. Uh, non-supernatural explanation for the, the creation and propagation of the nation of Israel. And so Voss is reacting to that. He's saying the infallible character of Revelation, the objectivity of the groundwork of Revelation, and the foundation of inspiration, the foundation of inspiration. Um, uh, we'll do the method, then take the break. We'll do the method, then take the break. Um, method. Method. Um, number one. Uh, we must consider the structure and relationship to the concept of covenant. Now, um, I cannot emphasize enough how important the covenant is, okay? It is so important, all right? So um, I, sent a, uh, I sent a word search, a passage, uh, word search of all the uses of covenant in Old Testament and New Testament and in the Septuagint. We'll look at that after the break. Um, number two, this is, this is so good. This is so good. Our dogmatic constructions of truth, that is systematic theology, based on the finished product of revelation, must not be imported into the minds of the original recipients of revelation. Otherwise, there is no revelation. <laughs> if, if what we know in the New Testament was in their mind in the first tense, it makes no sense. It's all at one time. So there is this progressive nature. So we have to look at it in its original context, exegetically, historical grammatical context. Okay. We can't just, we just can't look at it from a Christian, a Christian uh, framework, although we are. So there's, 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 there's a caveat there. Um, and number three, uh, and this is more for time frame. Because there's a lot of concepts that happen again and again. What he, what he says in method is we're looking at a collective treatment of each concept or content as compared to a Bible survey approach. So we're not looking at a Bible survey approach. If we do a Bible survey approach, you're going to have a lot of the same themes coming over again. What he's doing is he, he's going to look at a section of scripture and then divide it into um, a collective treatment, if that makes sense. Okay. Everyone tracking with me? Okay, let's take a, a 10 minute break. I hope you're learning. Let's take a 10 minute break and we'll come back at 8.28, 8.28. After the method, he discusses uh, the practical uses of biblical theology. So what, what are the practical uses? We're gonna go a little bit quickly here. Um, number one, exhibits the organic growth growth of the truths of special revelation. So again, we're looking at this idea of organic growth, not only in how it's, it's similar, but looks different. Also in um, other post Voss authors, and I think as well, um, I shouldn't say post Voss, but Voss's pupils, they will talk about as far as like, when we talk about organic growth, we can also talk about 
it's not a linear time perspective with the revelation. Okay, it's not linear, or or um, uh, it, it 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 has different. Uh, Richard Gaffin will talk about. There's different twins, uh, twists and turn as Israel is being brought um, through their uh, sin, <laughs> yet grace of God to be brought to redemption. Okay, so we can we can look at the organic growth, how truth has been unfolded before us, how it's been revealed to us. Again, not giving new truth, but revealing the truth. Um, and then, of course, this is what he says. It's an antidote to rationalistic criticism. And so this is a, a big... Um, now, for us, not so much because there's a high view of, a high view of scripture in... Um, so it's, it's an antidote for rationalistic criticism. So we have a high view of scripture in the Philippines. And so, but, but that is also coming. It's, it's really in Manila. It's in, it's in a lot of the academic circles, academia in the universities in Manila. Um, and so it is affecting the church. I know when I taught outside of Manila in um, PTS College and Advanced Studies, the students were, some of them were playing with it. <laughs> So um, I hope that they have not, uh, but you can, you can definitely see that pressure to follow along with that. Um, it imparts new life and freshness to truth. So when we have this new place to explore, the Old Testament comes alive. It comes alive for us because now there is, there is great benefit. We see that organic connection that in fact, the Old Testament plays a role in our life, in the life of the church, a much more fundamental role that maybe we had not anticipated. So there's new, it, it gives new life and freshness. Um, and then it also counteracts against anti-doctrinal tendencies. So where there's this emphasis upon pietism and also emotionalism, it's reacting to that. It's saying that we should have a practical faith, but we should also have a deep faith. We should have a deep faith. And, and it protects against um, fundamental doctrines from isolated proof texts. You, you, every one of us has seen it. The, the isolated proof text that seems to be very Mahirap. It's like, I don't know if that's what it's saying, right? It's like, <laughs> that's a hard one. So when you have the framework, you don't, of course, you always need scriptural basis. I'm not saying we don't need scriptural basis, but sometimes we finagle. Um, I'm going to give a testimony. There was someone here. Um, they asked me a question about, oh, it's, it was Henry. Henry asked me a question a year ago. Um, he wanted to hear my perspective on on the question for me. Did Henry remember this question? It was, it was a, I still remember the question. It's a great question. He said, how would you defend how would you defend against someone who says that someone is someone dies and they had not confessed their last sin? How would you defend that they're in heaven? Dubai, you asked me that question. You wanted to hear my perspective. He was preparing for a big uh, uh, exam, and so he wanted to hear my perspective. And so we had talked about we can we can look at a proof text that maybe in an indirect way points to that, or we can look at a framework, or we can look at the 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 systematic truth. And so I said, without going to any scriptural passage, if we accept union with Christ, union with Christ guaranteed, you're in heaven, without going to scripture. Now, of course, we need to go to scripture, and union with Christ is coming from scripture, but we're looking at that deep theological truth that it just if, if you hold a union with Christ, Cigarado, he's in heaven, right? And so then, of course, we can give proof texts to support, but what I'm trying to get at is when you understand the deeper theological truths, when you understand the framework, it really protects against weak arguments, because the argument might be true, but it, you know the tr it might be a true statement, but it's a weak argument. Diva, it's like I agree with that statement, but I don't know if I agree with it coming from that passage. <laughs> Do you see what I'm saying? Do you see what I'm saying? So it's like, I agree with that. That's a good truth. But I don't know if it's coming from that passage that you're giving to me. And so this really guards against isolated proof text. Any comments or questions? Ending.
Uh, Enting, I think you want to say something. Then, then we need to, we need to run. We need to we need to run. Go ahead, Enting. Yeah, yeah. So um, here in number three. Yeah. I think number two. Um, it it really guards us from this criticism uh, because we are looking at scripture from this particular frame, um, and and that's very helpful. But going back earlier, Tim, I I, I was supposed to ask this question. Uh, just for practical insight from you. Um, Boss said the main challenge or the main problem will be how to do justice to the individual peculiarities of the agents in Re Revelation. Yeah. And so, so the question there is how can we, because the thing about biblical theology is we can impose our big picture to every passage in the scripture, which puts us in the danger of flattening the text yeah. instead of seeing the beauty of every text. Yeah. Um, yeah. In 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 your own um, exegetical process, how would you keep yourself from from doing that? Yeah. So so that so that's why that's why going through bosses these fundamental points. Is really fun. Is really primary before we go to the, discussing the frameworks. And if you notice, Voss, when he starts, he's not going. Now I think he actually does describe his his like covenantal framework, but his focus is more on just covenant and then these guide guide points. And then he's going to work through the text. And so what I want I want to say the way we guard is that. We do, we, there is an interrelationship between the New Testament and the Old Testament, but we have to let the Old Testament speak, but being aware that this is what the Old Testament has already told us. Meaning to say that in one sense, when we look, when we look at old, the Old Testament scriptures, we can never unsee what we see because of Christ, right? We can never unsee that. And that's part of the process. At the same time, we need to do as but much as possible allowing the text to speak to us, okay? So there is, in one sense, an, inter, an interplay. In another sense, though, that's why we need to work through this, these fundamental, this fundamental task, um, and, you know, before, like, going into all the debates with the different frameworks. Do you, see, do you see what I'm saying? In one sense, we have to do that first, yeah. Good, good, good question, yeah. Okay, let, let's go on here. We are, we are really... Oh my goodness, we're running out of time here. Um, all right, definitions and types of revelation. So um, Voss did not have this. This would be another, uh, this would be a, uh, maybe a little bit of a critique I would have. Maybe he does. I, I didn't remember reading it, but we do want to just talk about the different types of what revelation is. This is to help us. Number one, uh, um, revelation in a general sense is the, is an uncovering. That is an act of self-disclosure and self-communication. So when we use the word revelation, this is what I'm meaning. Next, we have this idea of natural revelation. That is God's revelation through the created universe, okay? I think Voss touches on this maybe in chapter two, okay? Um, I think he does. I think he touches on this in chapter two. Um, but, um, but, he does not, um, uh, uh, we are not going to engage, natural revelation is not pertinent to this course, okay? So we will not be looking at natural revelation. We'll be looking at, um, rather, we'll be looking at special revelation. Um, some people will say supernatural revelation, special revelation. And this is God's particular self-revelation at specific times and places to particular people as in the events of Israel's history and Jesus Christ. This is what we mean by special revelation. Now, looking at this definition, if we accept this definition, categorically, we have to say there is no more special revelation being given. Does everyone see that? By this definition, because what people will say is that God is going to, God cannot reveal himself any more than he has revealed in Christ. Does everyone see that? 
God's particular, so God is self-revealing himself in specific times and places and in particular people as in events, Israel's history, and finally and comprehensively in Christ. So I want to say this again. By this definition, there is no more self, there is no more special revelation, okay? Because then when, when, we, when we talk about special revelation, we're saying that God is revealing himself in a special way to someone else that he has not done through Christ. And that's heresy. That is, that is, that is a different gospel, however you want to say it. Um, God has finally and climactically in Christ revealed himself to us. And there is nothing more than that. So perhaps this definition really clarifies the earlier discussions. And again, we're going to get to the text, okay? We're going to get to the text. Uh, I, there is a chance that we might not do it tonight. Um, we will go just a tad bit over because we started late. So uh, actually, I was meaning to mention this earlier. If we start late, that's fine, but I'm going to hold, I'm going to hold everyone over a little bit, however late we start. So if you want to end at nine, we all need to be here at, at, at 6 p.m., okay? I know if there's an extenuating circumstance you're coming in really late, that's fine. Um, but let's let's make every effort to be here at, at six, okay? Um, so by this definition, we should all be in agreement. There is no more. No one, can, God is not revealing ever now in, in some way better than he has revealed in Christ. And to say that is idolatry, okay? All right, I will say that very strongly, okay? Lastly, this is helpful. Progressive revelation is the view of God's revelation as known through Scripture in a continuing process in which later revelation is built on earlier so that new aspects of revelation may be revealed and early ones may be clarified and elaborated upon. So what's in italics, I added. Um, but it's a clarification. It's an elaboration. It's adding to, not in a uh, qualitative sense. Okay, not in a qualitative sense, as Voss says. The flower is the seed. The flower is the seed. Okay, now we're going to look at this idea of covenant, okay? Um, the two words for covenant in Scripture are berith, that's the, the Hebrew word for covenant, and diatheke, okay? I, you know, I typically don't use Greek, especially in a non-Greek required class. I'm using this because Voss uses it. I'm using this because Voss uses it. So whenever you see these words, be thinking Greek for covenant and Hebrew for covenant, okay? Um, so at this point, let us look at the handout. So I'm going to stop this slideshow for a minute. Um, I hope everyone has, okay, so... Um, I hope that everyone has, um, were you able to access those, those handouts that I, I shared earlier today? Was everyone able to do that? Um, if not, they're on the cloud. They're also on the Facebook group. I'm going to load them up here for us, for our benefit. All right, so <clears throat> I shared all of these handouts with you on the Google Drive and also on the Facebook group. So if you're still coming in here, you're new, I need to get your email information. I need to get your Facebook information so I can add you to these groups. Um, I'm going to look through these briefly to show you what, what is going on here. And there's no, I don't have a requirement in the course, but I highly recommend. Now, if you're just, if you've studied covenant before, and you're like, yeah, I agree that that's the fundamental, that's a fundamental uh, concept in scripture, how God relates, then you don't have to look at these. Okay. But if you're, if you're questioning, um, Voss's use of covenant, if, you, if you're questioning, like, you know, oh, I, um, um, oh, I, I, you know, I'm not sure I agree with what Voss is saying. This is for you, okay? This is for you, all right? So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to look through these briefly just to show you what's going on here um, so that you get the, the whole shebang. Now, 
in some of this, especially in these uh, definitions, um, there's going to be a lot of Hebrew, like, but it's just going to be the Hebrew word itself. But you can still understand what's being said. So you don't have to know Hebrew. You don't have to know Greek to look through these definitions. But, it, but, but you know, if you know it, it's better. And again, this is at a THM level class. Uh, sorry, TH, uh, CGST level class. So let's just look through these really briefly. So I'm going to go first to um, this handout. So this is, this is uh, Bereth. Uh, so that's just the Hebrew text. This is coming from Hallett resource. And so essentially here, there's a lot of wasted space here. So I don't, don't be stressed about this. What this is doing here for you now is it's giving you this, the semantic, uh, the, the definition, the meaning and the range of meaning. Okay. So here you have the first meaning that's often used, and then you're going to have, um, ha specific examples of how it's used. So for example, here, between persons, okay? Um, the benefit for you though is number one, this definition, um, and then number two, um, there's going to be a lot of references here, okay? So that's a benefit for you, all right? So you won't get everything, but it will, it will be helpful for you to get a range. Look at, these are all examples of how it's used, okay? So that's the benefit. That's the benefit for you. Okay. So this is this is a range of meaning. Okay. Um, so the, okay. So there's A, and then this is B here. So this is this is a uh, this is this is another range, if you can imagine A and B within this broader idea of arrangement. Okay. So just coming down through here, there's a lot of there's a ton of examples. So these are references that you can look up. Okay, that, that is for, if you, if you can write this down, so for the, the handout with Bereith definition for Hallot, H-A-L-O-T, that's the range of meaning and definition. The same thing for Diatheki, uh, BDAG. So if you look here, again, you have examples. There's no, this is not an assignment. This is, this is extra, this is extra, this is a, if you want to go deeper, if like for, for Sonny or someone else wants to go deeper, you can, but this is not an assignment, okay? Uh, this, is, this is similar to the Old Testament, but now in the New Testament, and actually also with this, the Septuagint, which is the Old Testament Greek translation, okay? So again, you have, you have the, the, the range of meaning here, so compact contract, you had above testament and will, you also have, I think that's it. So this is the range in... Um, and a lot of the Greek, the Greek manuscripts, both biblical and extra biblical. Okay. So again, this is primary information. You can also get this information on step Bible. So maybe on Sunday night, we can have, we can work on step Bible. I can show you how to do that for the time being. Um, because, uh, I don't require step Bible for, for CGST, um, later in our in our EBST, we will require you to know Step Bible, so I would have you do this yourself. So I'm just giving you the information so that you can contemplate. You don't have to you don't have to research it. Okay. So that's for these. That's for the two. So the 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 Bereith Hallet and also the Diatheke definition BDAG. Okay. Um, th this next one here. So this is this is uh, Bereith definition TDOT. So I'm going to click on that. This is different, okay? This is also giving you the range of meaning, but it's also giving you, Kuya Boboy, you're going to like this. You're going to like this, Kuya Boboy. Etymology. So this is giving word history. Word history. So this is more looking at how the word is used historically and also in the biblical text historically, okay? And also extra biblical. Okay, so this is giving you a history of the word as well. Okay, so... Um, Again, extra information for you to consider the use of, of, of Bereith, a, a fundamental word used in the scripture, and then also TDNT. So again, TDNT is Theological Dictionary of the New Testament. And so you're looking at this word, um, uh, diatheke, which is, I just gave you the, the English form here. So this is, again, giving you the history. Like here, there's going to be a lot of Greek usage, maybe that's not helpful for you. But if you look up, 
if you look up its actual um, references, this here is extra biblical, but you also have biblical. You also have biblical references here. So you also have NT. So you have the NT there, and then you can look up. So you can look up these references in English to see what it's saying in English, okay? Um, so maybe you don't want to do this. It's, it, this is too much for you. Absolutely. I, this is, do not be stressed. No one should be stressed right now, okay? This is optional. If you want to go deeper, if some of you know Greek, Sonny knows Greek, maybe some other CGST students know Greek, this is just for your private study and, and to go deeper, okay? So no stress, okay? If you're wrestling with the use of, of, of covenant, maybe it's, it, you know, you want to think about how fundamental it is. This is, this is for you, okay? The next handout that I want to share with you now, this is more beneficial, okay? Um, more be beneficial, okay? Um, I did word searches for you. So let's go to this word search. So I'm going to go first to word search, Berith Old Testament. So this is uh, every time the Hebrew word was used, it could be used between people. It could be used between God and man. It could be used between nations. I word searched it. In this case, I copy and pasted. it. <laughs> so I didn't copy paste this time, okay? But, but so this is for your own personal Bible study. So these are all the references of Berith in the Old Testament, almost like a concordance. So you can look at these, you can look at how this, this word is used, okay? So there's um, 21 pages, okay? 21 pages, all right? But you can get, you, you're getting the raw data so you can see like what Sonny talks about. This, they have this covenantal framework. This is the raw data. So you can look at all these different references and begin to formulate your own understanding of covenant, okay? So 27 page, 21 pages of covenant, it's used a lot. It's used a lot, okay? So we should be really contemplating this, this uh concept, which, which Voss says is fundamental to biblical theology, okay? Um, uh, this here uh, is w because what's really interesting here is uh, the Greek word is used in many parallel with the Hebrew, but sometimes different. And so again, I'm giving you a range of how it's used in, in the Greek translation that, to help us contemplate how it's used, okay? So again, this one here, this is 27 pages. So this is a lot of references, a lot of references. So you could even do a year study in this, all right? Um, uh, New Testament as well. New Testament as well, okay? So here, um, uh, so especially with people that might be struggling with our relationship to covenant, because when it comes down to a different framework, some framework says, you're not a part of the covenant. Um, uh, let's just, I'm just going to briefly look at this so that we can be thinking about this promise fulfillment, right? So I'm just going to highlight here, okay? I'm going to highlight some things here, okay? Uh, this, Matthew 26, 28, the blood of the covenant that's poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. The blood of of the covenant. So if you want salvation, if you want to be in union with Christ, you have to be a member of the covenant. You have to receive, you have to have that, the blood, the blood covers us, okay? But the blood, the sacrifice is connected with covenant. So you're seeing how it's kind of becoming more important, okay? Um, Mark 24, 14, it's, it's almost a parallel. Um, Luke 1, 1, 72, that this is a reference to the Davidic, Davidic covenant here. So Davidic covenant's referenced. Um, Luke 22, Luke 22. And likewise, he, they took the cup and had eaten it saying, this cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. So, when do we do this? Someone raise their hand. Someone make a comment. When do we, when, when do we do this? Luke twenty two twenty. When do we do this? Lord's so, Supper. Lord's Supper.
it was only halfway through my theology, my theology study that I realized that we celebrate the new covenant every month in our church, whether we realize it or not. We are members of the new covenant. And the new covenant is promised in the Old Testament for Israel. So there's, in some way, we are within the new covenant, especially if we're going to be covered by the blood of Jesus, and especially as we celebrate it once a month. So I hope that everyone, however you fall on the different scale of frameworks, I hope that we're seeing more and more that we are more closely related to the Old Testament than we might have first thought because we celebrate the new covenant every month or every week if you celebrate it every week. Um, uh, I won't go to all of these. Let me just highlight a couple others. Um, um, 2 Corinthians 3.6, 2 Corinthians 3.6, who has made us sufficient to be the ministers, ministers of the new covenant. So this is, this is Paul. This is Paul. This is Paul. He's saying he's a minister of the new covenant. <laughs> oh my goodness. And more importantly, the letter uh, not of the letter, so this is a reference most likely to the Old Covenant, not to the letter, but to the Spirit. Look at the connection here. You can't escape it. And this, it's the Spirit that gives life. So fundamental to the new covenant is the spirit. And I hope and pray we're all praying that the spirit be in us, right? So I hope we're seeing this. I hope we're seeing this. Galatians 3.15. Galatians 3.15 is all about the gospel, right? Galatians 3.15 is, that's the main topic of Galatians 3, of, of, sorry, Galatians, the epistle of Galatians is, is the gospel, and notice the emphasis of covenant in the declaration of the gospel. So again, there's different covenants. There's a lot to be teased out. But regardless, covenant is absolutely fundamental. It's fundamental to the framework of scripture. It's fundamental to, to, uh, to the history of Revelation. Look at this. Remember you. So this is Gentiles. This is Gentiles here. Remember that you were at one time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers to the covenant of promise. You were once strangers having no hope and without God in the, wor in the world. So right, right? So one time you were separated from Christ. This is Messiah. So this is a Jewish reference here. And so later, we're going to see that they're brought near. Uh, they're members of the same household. Okay? So again, I want us to be seeing the absolute fundamental nature of covenant, and it's fundamental to biblical theology. And then lastly, we have a ton of references in Hebrews. A ton of references in Hebrews. Not only is Paul a minister of the covenant, Christ is the mediator of a better covenant. He's a mediator of a better covenant. Are you receiving his mediation? If you are, then you're part of the new covenant. This covenant concept is absolutely fundamental to our faith. Here we go again. He is a mediator of a new covenant. Um, which receives a promised inheritance. Here we go, 1224. The mediator of a new covenant sprinkled with blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. Now may the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus and great shepherd of the sheep by the blood of the eternal covenant. So new covenant is also called Eternal covenant. So what I'm trying to I'm trying to help us to see here is that for sure, as Sonny said, 
we have to we have to work through this to figure out all these different covenants um for sure okay um at the same time we need to understand wherever we are in understanding the new testament we must understand that we are members of the new covenant new covenant and thus we are our foundation is the old testament and so as we work through the history of revelation um as we work through these topics uh you know boss did not give all of this type information boss just gave us the conclusion covenant is fundamental to the method <laughs> that's all he said he said all of this he said all of this i just probably shared with you 50 pages or 60 pages of 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 data and boss just says covenant is fundamental right <laughs> so, so um it's it's 9 10 we are a little bit behind that's fine i don't want to rush this so um uh you have questions for your assignment we will begin this assignment first thing next week uh it's okay we are gonna we're gonna work through this um we're not going to be stressed. Maybe it's a little bit slow. It's fine. So next week, uh, still do your reading report three. Do your scripture reading report two. We will begin with our homework for um, uh, that's due today. We will begin that next week. And um, yeah, let's. Uh, I'm going to open up any questions or comments. We started about 10 minutes late, so we're ending, we're, we're ending on the money here. So any questions or comments before we close in prayer? Um, uh, I'll just open it up. I'll give you three minutes. Anyone want to make a comment before we close in prayer? You know, what I noticed with all the passages that we went through is, is, is the blood. And, and I want to point that one out because Voss said that when you talk about Beris, Buried as an agreement, it is not much of the, it is not much of the etymology of the word, or the word itself, but the but the religious sanctions that comes along with it that makes it unchangeable and unalterable. No, excellent, excellent point, excellent point. In many ways, you're absolutely right. It's it's they could have used different words okay it's 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 those concepts that are connected with the the the, the, the significance that is so important for us and and um uh read boss because he talks more about some of those things um from my perspective i wanted us my goal for for this portion was for you to see how important it is and to be honest with you brothers and sisters Many times I passed over this. I just passed over it because because the um, the, the early church was primarily Jewish until later, and they were so saturated with all of the with with the with the worship and the, and the scripture of the Old Testament. So much is just is just taken by is just taken on um, for granted. So there's no need it's there's no need to go into all these to teach the the, the fundamental things that they already know. For us, because we don't have that framework, it, 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 it's a little more challenging. Uh, the last thing I'll say, uh, the last thing I'll say is that, uh, and this really comes back to the idea of covenant, Old Testament, as Voss says, literally, literally is old covenant. New Testament is new covenant. When I when 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 that was revealed to me, I was just like, wow, wow. And so I think it's very appropriate. That the fundamental concept by which we think through these things, by which we think through the history of Revelation, that is God's self-revealing of himself, is through this idea of covenant. And as Pastor Enting so eloquently said, it's not just that word meaning at its most root, but all the concepts and everything connected. And in many ways, that's why I gave you the word search. Because you can see all the different concepts. You can see the religious practices. You can see the worship practices. You can see the, the redemption ideas. You can see the word revelation ideas surrounding the context of this word covenant. Okay? Um, let's close in prayer. I'm going to ask our fearless leader.
Pastor Henry Qua to close us in prayer. And um, Sunday night, no doubt you will have questions. You can come with your questions. You can come just to study in a, in a breakout session. Um, uh, we're going we're gonna to work through this. I hope you're learning. I hope that there's new worlds being revealed to you. It's deep. But I hope that it's practical. Pastor Henry, please, please close this in a word of prayer. Okay. Uh, Father God, we thank you for this class biblical theology. But Father, it would be sensible for us if you will reveal to us in an easier way so that we can understand what this subject matter is. Father, do not allow stress to come forward before us, but instead your love your strength, your wisdom that we can go through this uh, lesson. Father, we thank you for the time we have together and we thank you for Pastor Tim as he share his knowledge to us. Bless, night. Uh, bless this night for us. May you dismiss us with the love and care of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. I want to say one thing before we go, okay? Number one, I want you to be thinking about, for those of you who have seen The Matrix, you thought they had the, the, the red pill and the, I think it's the blue pill or the green pill. And it's like, maybe you got the pill tonight that you saw everything and maybe you're stressed. Don't be stressed. At least you can see the big picture and you're, you're viewing, you're viewing the, the, from the mountaintop, the valley in HD 8K, whatever it is, 8, 8K, and, and maybe you're a little stressed. Don't be stressed. Um, uh, you're in a better position than before it was revealed to you. So uh, do not hesitate to send me a message. Do not hesitate to, to come on Sunday night. Um, we're going slow, and, and I'm accompanying the reading with the explanation. So we... so. I really hope that as you read Voss, I'm helping guide you because it's just it's so important for us for all these, those reasons. So I want to I want to give you a blessing tonight. Don't be stressed. One day at a time, and um, uh, may God be with you all. <laughs>